Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so uh, you will receive a link to the recording in a follow up email. You've all joined in listen only mode. However, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the question and answer pane on the control panel. Um, you can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, we will collect these and then address them at the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Should you experience any technical difficulties, please let us know uh, in the question and answer box and a member of the organizing team will endeavor to help you. Uh, and in the unlikely event that we experience any issues, we will send out a message and restart the webinar uh, and hopefully we'll keep everything on track. Um, the presentation should last around 30 minutes uh, and then we'll have time to answer any of the questions that have been submitted. Um, at the end of the webinar today, please do take a couple of moments to complete a short survey where you can raise any further questions or, or give us some feedback as well. Uh, so on to our agenda points, uh, we'll be starting with a little bit about Cambridge Advance Online, uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, we'll move on then to the online experience and how our courses are designed uh, before some background of the course uh, lead and then the content of the course itself, uh, and then what outcomes the students should gain and uh, the type of support is offered as well. Uh, and then we'll have the time for questions and answers at the end. So just a quick introduction to today's panel. Uh, my name is Philip Perrin. I'm an enrollment advisor here at Cambridge Advance Online. Uh, next, we have Emily Tannett Patterson, one of our learning designers. Uh, and lastly, we have Dr. Liliana Frook. Liliana is our academic lead for bio nanotechnology from theory to practice and is an associate professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at the University of Cambridge. I'll now move on to a little bit about the Cambridge Advance Online program in some more detail. So Cambridge Advance Online is designed and created for the professional learner. Our courses are flexible and allow the learner to study around their schedule, whether that is in the morning, nights or weekends. We've also built in interactive sessions that allow for direct contact with our course leads. So very similar to today's presentation, you'll be able to connect with Liliana in a live session to discuss and cover the content with more depth and more interaction. Our courses are designed to have hands-on projects to allow students to work on practical experiences that they can turn around and use on the job right away, or it's a great opportunity to add to your portfolio. We keep the student success top of mind, so there's tons of resources uh, to support the learner. This we will cover in a little bit more depth further into today's session. Keeping in mind the flexibility, we do offer quarterly start dates. So you do have the ability to choose the best date for your schedule. Uh, we're currently working towards our next course, which is starting in September uh, on the 26th with a deadline to enroll by the 19th of September. Uh, one of the great things about the course is that it does come directly from the University of Cambridge. So upon completion, you will earn a certificate of uh, achievement directly from the University of Cambridge and signed by the Vice Chancellor. This will be great to then be able to use on any social platforms or for your CV or, or simply for your own recognition of your achievement. Uh, so I'm going to hand over now uh, to Liliana, who will be able to discuss a little bit more about herself and the course. Um, thank you, Liliana. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Philip, and uh, hi, everybody. So I started uh, um, my career as a chemist. I studied chemistry and did lots of uh, synthesis as well at the beginning of the career. And I got introduced to the field of bio nanotechnology early on. And this was in Glasgow when I was doing my PhD and we were developing a new spectroscopic analytic methodology to uh, analyze DNA. And for this kind of analysis, we needed silver nanoparticles. And this was some 15 years ago when nanotechnology was starting to become a little bit more present uh, in papers, but also in some commercial projects. So this was really exciting. Over the years uh, throughout my career, I had a chance to work with many different people in different countries in the world to gain experience on different aspects of bio nanotechnology. And this is a very interdisciplinary field. So we usually get into the field after we have studied physics or chemistry or biology or any other related uh, uh, fields as well. 
biomolecules and nanoparticles are very similar in size. So we are talking about nanoscales. So it's not surprising that bio nanotechnology tries to combine them. So throughout my postdoctoral experience and then some and then the independent career in Germany, I have been always looking into the inspiration um, to take inspiration from nature and then to combine some natural biomolecules and some man-made structures. And in particularly, I was uh, interested in light and using light as the way to guide chemical reactions, but also to interface biomolecular interactions. I also had throughout my career interaction with professionals from different fields. Um, I used to work a lot with artists and designers as well, because as you can imagine, any new technology is always very exciting, not only for new inventions and providing solutions to new challenges, but also from other aspects of life. So some of the artists that were hosted in my lab used some of the nanomaterials that we work for their art installations. So through all of these interactions, I also needed to learn how to communicate some of the difficult concepts to people who might not have experience um, in the background. And often people ask me, how did I end up doing bio nanotechnology? But the truth is, uh, I was always interested in studying the nature. I was interested in exploring what is happening on the molecular level in natural processes. And by combining chemistry and some of these new materials that we started to make, I was really hoping to find solutions for some of the ongoing challenges. Currently in our work in Cambridge University, we work a lot towards sustainable manufacturing. So we try to exploit nanomaterials and natural enzymes as the way to change chemical industry and to change the way reactions are catalyzed today. But then throughout our research, we also realized that materials that we design for chemical industry can be adapted a little bit and also used in nanomedicine. And this is the beauty of working with biomaterials and biologically inspired materials. You always find multiple facets to those structures and also different applications. So as I said, we design both materials for chemical industry, but also for um, nanomedicine. Mainly we work on pancreatic cancer, so developing structures that can be used for treatment of pancreatic cancer, which is one of the worst cancers in terms of survival, but also there is lack of drugs that can be used for treatment. And we also are very interested in exploring aged cells, particularly those cells that appear in our body after chemotherapy. Some of you might uh, be familiar with, uh, with the chemotherapy or what it entails. And usually we use it to remove cancer cells, but in the process, we often damage healthy cells and they sometimes get into this cycle of fast aging. We are particularly interested in exploring diagnostic tools for those aged cells, but also to explore some uh, therapeutics. Taking into account all of these projects that we work on and also diversity of researchers that need to be involved because you need to work with chemists, engineers, but also a lot with clinicians. I was also teaching uh, different subjects throughout my career. And I started teaching bio nanotechnology around 10 years ago, uh, particularly because I wanted to introduce the concepts to people and researchers and students from different fields. And I have realized as, as, as I was teaching that the often the barrier in understanding some of these concepts is the language, the lack of the common language and the lack of the common background, because the physicist might understand, might understand some concepts behind analytical methods, 
um, electron microscopy or any other spectroscopy, but a chemist might be a little bit better in understanding the chemical reactions or uh, the structure of biomolecules. And I felt that there is a need for a, uh, for a particular uh, synergy in terms of the textbook, but also a course that would be offered um, to interested um, learners. And then additional motivation that was um, that, that came uh, just recently throughout the pandemic was, of course, development of mRNA vaccine. Uh, we had the vaccine which was stabilized uh, by use of lipid nanoparticles. And understandably, there was lots of discussions uh, in media, in different circles. There were lots of misunderstandings about this technology. And I really wanted to create a course which would be available to anybody in the world from different backgrounds where we would learn about the principles of bio nanotechnology, about the design of nanoparticles, and also what can we use the bio nanotechnology for also besides nanomedicine. And this is how we created um, our online course. Sometimes uh, I get questions uh, who is this course for or what kind of background I need to have. I always say that motivation is the most important. If there is a willingness to learn and to spend six weeks really going through discussions and checking the literature and learning from the course, then this will be a successful course and a good course for you. It helps to have some scientific background or engineering background, just simply because it's a little bit easier to get into the subject and cover all of the different uh, applications. But we also had in our courses designers. So we had recently a designer that is working a lot with the textiles and she wanted to learn a little bit more about materials and also how to code nanoparticles or nanomaterials. And although it was a little bit difficult in terms of the chemistry, we always have different parts of the course very much adapted to different professions. Um, so we could pick up the chemistry when she felt that um, she doesn't know enough. And we also had entrepreneurs who are working in businesses which are related to bio nanotechnology and they simply wanted to learn a little bit more about the potential of the field. What is important is no matter what kind of background you have, you always can interact with me, with tutors on the course, but with also with other participants. And they all have different backgrounds. And through this interaction, you can learn a little bit more about the things that might not be clear. Or if you want a little explanation on a particular topic, you might just ask one of the peers in the course, could you please explain it to me? So I would say if you are asking yourself, is this for me? Yes, if you are curious to know what is bio nanotechnology and what are the applications besides nanomedicine and what are the potentials of technology in the future? So let me tell you a little bit about the practicalities um, of the course. So what we try to do is, of course, we try to learn about the different tools in bio nanotechnology, but we also try to apply strategies that we develop uh, throughout the course onto the uh, challenges. And we also ask the participants, people, so all of you that might be taking the course to bring their own challenges. So we learn about the tools by taking real life challenges as an example. What we also want to learn is not only how to design tools, but also how to analyze those tools. So what are the right uh, appropriate analytical methods that you might use to analyze what are the appropriate combinations of material that you want to use um, for your solution. Because you might have lots of tools, 
but what is the good way of putting them together? This is very important to learn. And what we also wanted to emphasize is how important it is to communicate. And particularly if you are working in such an interdisciplinary field as bio nanotechnology. So we try to encourage you to communicate your challenges, your solutions, your techniques in a clear way. So that you, if you need to apply for some funding or you just need to talk to somebody about those concepts, you can really handle it. And this is also part of our assessment. I would just also like to tell you a little bit about the different modules we have. So there are six weeks. We are learning very intensely during the six uh, weeks, but we also wanted to make sure that learning is fun. Um, we will, throughout these six weeks, we also have live lectures, which usually then combine answering some of the questions you might have on the issues. So there are always structures, uh, struct structured individually, really, um, according to your own interest and discussions you had and, and maybe some challenges that you came across. So there are different kinds, different modules. We do have uh, um, modules that are introducing nanomaterials. We are then uh, trying to also assess your knowledge at the beginning. So we need to know at what level are you and where can we help you a little bit more? What is your level of knowledge in chemistry, physics, engineering? Then we also have a definition of a problem. So throughout your six weeks, you are defining a problem you really want to work on. So you bring your own challenge into the project and you work towards a solution using bio nanotechnology you learn about during the course. We then also evaluate existing solutions. So if your problem is, for example, tackling um, an energy crisis and you want to use uh, a particular novel enzyme to produce biofuel, then we will look what are the existing solutions out there already and what kind of uh, advantages would bring making nanomaterials or bio nanomaterials for catalyzing the biofuel production. And then once when we really decide together, right, you really should be using bio nano to solve your problem, then we go to look what kind of novel strategies can we de de devise. How can we combine nano, which nanoparticles or nanomaterial we need to take how do we modify this nanomaterial and how do we combine it with anything else we might need to solve your challenge? So it's a very exciting process. And we often learn from you as well, as much as you learn from us. We also, once when we have a strategy that you can use to solve your challenge, then we don't leave it at this. We don't want it to be a piece of paper that you will never use again, but we go a little bit further and we look into the viability of your solution. So we look which steps we need to take to really make your solution translatable and practically applicable. And we look a little bit at the cost of your solution. And then we try to adapt it and see, can we maybe use something a little bit more cost effective? What are our options? At the end, you basically have a fully designed project where you have defined the problem, you have analyzed solutions, you have proposed a novel solution, and you have proposed the steps that will help you bring that solution from the lab to the practice. And this is basically a part of your assessment. I would just like to mention uh, that we, of course, were thinking about the assessment a lot. And uh, we know that there is lots of learning and lots of new concepts that we need to kind of introduce. And therefore, 
every week you do a little part of your final assessment, which is assessed separately. And then at the end, you don't have a big piece that you need to deliver, but you can combine your things uh, as well as you find fit. Okay, I think now I can I can handle um, I can hand over to Emily to talk a little bit about the whole course design as well, and then I will be back again to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Liliana. Hi, I'm Emily Tanner Patterson. I'm one of the learning designers for Cambridge Advance Online. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the student experience and uh, how we design our courses and what that means for you as a student on the course. So first off, as you see in front of you, the course is primarily asynchronous. What that means is that you have 24 seven access to our uh, learning platform, which is Canvas, which you also see in front of you. It's really beautiful. It's really interactive. Um, and it allows us to really bring the information to light. So you're not going to be sitting reading lots of boring black and white web pages. You're gonna have not only beautiful illustrations, but also interactive learning activities, um, videos of the wonderful Dr. Frook, and as well, you'll get to interact with her on that weekly live session. We have a number of social um, activities built into the course design. Uh, that's for two reasons. Number one, research shows us that you learn a great deal from your peers. And as Dr. Frick said, bio-nanotechnology is highly interdisciplinary. And we think the best way to achieve that is for you to be able to interact with your peers on the course. So we use discussion boards and we use Miro and we use a few other tools to make that happen. So you can see that the cohort experience is very connected. And one of the things that our learners say is that they find that uh, that social element of the course is to be one of their, their best parts of their uh, Cambridge Advance Online course. There are up to 30 co learners per cohort, and each cohort has one tutor. So you have a tutor who's assigned just to you and your peers to be there for you, to support you as you're moving through the course. Whether that means you need a little bit of tech support, Canvas isn't behaving itself, you're having trouble submitting your assignment, you can't access something that you're meant to be able to access, or that means that you need an additional bit of feedback, you don't quite understand what you might have done incorrectly in some place, you need some signposting to some further resources, that tutor is there and our tutors are excellent. They're trained internally and um, we vet all of them to ensure that they have uh, knowledge of how to lead online courses as well as the subject area knowledge in bio nanotechnology. And again, you have lots of opportunities to connect with your fellow learners. There are the, the discussion boards and the activities I already mentioned. We have an inbuilt messaging system so that you're not having to rely on WhatsApp, social media, handing out your personal email address to anybody that you just met online. It's all baked into Canvas so that we can monitor it and keep you safe. Um, and then again, we have these weekly tutor-led live sessions. So some of the live sessions, I believe, are primarily with Dr. Frook. Some of them may occasionally be led by tutors. Um, so overall, what we find on our courses is that uh, you have a really clear, well-supported, and connected learning experience so that you can gain the knowledge that you're looking for and make those advances in your personal life that you're hoping that this course will serve. I just want to hand that back over to Phil, who can uh, talk to you a little bit more about how to join us. Thanks, Emily. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, great. So just wanted to spend a little bit of time just letting you know about the other support and benefits available to learners before, during, and after the course uh, takes place. Uh, firstly, we have an extremely helpful and responsive team of enrollment advisors uh, like myself to help answer any of your questions you may have on the course of the program. Um, should you decide to enroll on a course, we also have a dedicated customer service team to assist with the processing of orders and handling payment queries. Um, during the course, expert tutors are on hand to ensure student success. The small cohort size that Emily's just mentioned previously uh, means that learners have a great access to the skills and knowledge of their assigned tutor. Uh, tutors help to facilitate uh, the discussions and, and group activities, including the peer review, uh, and they also lead the majority of the live sessions that take place uh, as well. 
And um, lastly, we do have a dedicated in-house support team who are available to assist uh, throughout the course, uh, prior to the course and after with any technical, technical issues that participants may have. Uh, and they're also available via email and phone should any problems arise. For example, if you're unable to log into the learning platform or had any difficulties finding where to submit an assignment. Uh, it would be great to connect with anyone uh, that does have further questions or, or wants to dive deeper into the contents of what was covered today. Uh, there is a link on the screen to, to book an appointment with myself or, or one of the team. Uh, this link will be shared in a follow-up email as well after the webinar, but if you did want to take it down, then please do so. Uh, it only takes a few moments to schedule a call, which usually have about 10, 15 minutes just to chat through things, but um, always more time if we need to. Um, course enrollments can be done right online. Uh, we can also accept bank transfers as well. Uh, it would be helpful uh, if you did have any questions around this to understand what option works best for you so we can give you the best advice and the right details. Right, uh, that's coming towards the end of our presentation. So uh, we've got lots of time to go through some of the questions that have been posed today. Uh, so let's have a quick look and see what we've got. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So uh, if we can start at the top, it uh, looks like these questions are probably mostly going to be for Liliana, I think. <laughs> There's uh, some questions there. Uh, but if we can start at the top, is a quick question, which I think you covered slightly about the, the type of um, person that would be suitable for the course. But um, how much chemistry do I need to know to take this course? Well, I mean, it is nice to know a little bit of chemistry. So this would be always helpful. But we recently had several learners that didn't really have a strong background in chemistry. The last time they thought they learned about chemistry was in the high school. Um, so we do have some uh, background filling uh, quizzes and uh, sections within the course where you can learn a little bit more about chemistry. And then, of course, in the discussions, we learn a little bit of a chemical equations. But bio nanotechnology, as we teach it here, doesn't go very deep into chemical reactions and mechanisms of reactions. So no worries if last time you learned about chemistry was in the high school and you know just about how to write a molecule of water and you know what is the protein in general terms. We will, we try to fill in the gaps as well. What is important is that there is this willingness to really learn a little bit from the disciplines that might not be related to what your background is. So this is more important than really having a bulk of the knowledge. I am a chemist. And some of the tutors are chemists, so we can definitely handle any, anybody who is not familiar <laughs> with chemistry. Awesome. Thank you, Liliana. Um, yeah, another one here, I think um, it's probably for you. So uh, it, you mentioned that bio nanotechnology can be used to solve problems. Um, so thinking a little bit about climate change and the recent heat wave we've uh, been experiencing here in the UK, is it possible to use bio nanotechnology to solve issues related to climate change? Mm. Good question. And, and this would, for example, make an excellent challenge for the course as well. If somebody wants to go in and say, OK, throughout six weeks, I'm going to try to solve one challenge related to climate change using bio nanotechnology. And I can say, indeed, bio nanotechnology has been used to develop some tools that could help us in dealing with some of the issues. For example, there are lots of researchers and also big companies working on artificial photosynthesis. So how could we use sunlight and CO2 to produce valuable chemicals? So this is one of the aspects that is directly related to climate change and CO2 fixation. And in order to make this kind of systems, you often need to use novel nanomaterials. And particularly if you want to design artificial photosynthesis or artificial leaf, you also sometimes want to combine proteins or enzymes with those nanomaterials. So this is one aspect of the use. Recently, there have been uh, lots of investigations, of, of course, um, as well on uh, new types of batteries. So energy storage. So if you really can harvest solar energy, 
Can you then store it for a long term? And there have been several researchers that actually already patented and commercialized some of the aspects where they use viruses in combination with nanoparticles to create a new generation of batteries. How cool is that? So indeed, there are many more aspects that of the bio nanotechnology that can be used. Because if you think about the climate change, the best inspiration comes from nature and from the biomolecules around. We just need to fine tune them a little bit to adapt them to big issues um, such as climate change. So yes, we can. That's a good answer. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, we've got a question here and, and uh, there's two questions that are a little bit similar, so perhaps we can do them uh, together. So um, the questions here, I'll read them both together. So do we have to identify the problem and work for the solutions? Um, and do we have to identify our area of interest, design a project and find the solution? So I guess it's just a little mm. bit about how the course is structured and if, and if that fits in. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't expect you to come uh, to the course knowing the problems already. We will guide you, particularly in the introductory module and this first one, two modules, we will try to inspire you to look and find a suitable challenge. We always try to encourage learners also to choose something personal, something that might have affected you, something that you might have seen. Just to give you an example of problems or challenges that we had uh, before, we had recently one um, attendee who was interested in designing neuronal interfaces, particularly for people who are injured and they're in the wheelchair. Can we design new type of implants that can deal with this kind of injury? Then we had one learner who was particularly interested in soil health. How, how do you make uh, agri agriculture more sustainable and how can you make soil healthier without using too much fertilizers or without using pesticides and insecticides to, to deal with all of the pests that you might have. Uh, and we, of course, continuously have lots of lots of learners that choose medical issues. This might be a particular cancer targeting um, and we some biosensing and early diagnostics, uh, probably also inspired by recent pandemic. Uh, uh, there were lots of lots of examples where our learners wanted to design biosensor that will detect cancer or a virus very early. And indeed, you can do this using nanomaterials uh, very well. And we look into this. So if you are unsure what your problem might be, we will definitely help you to find the problems. We don't have a problem in finding you a problem to work on. So no worries about that. And uh, yeah, I, th I think you've just touched on it, Liliana, about biosensors as well, but we've got a question here. Um, I'm a graduate of electronics engineering, specifically in the application of artificial intelligence to mm. agrobiological systems. And uh, the question is, may I know if this course could also encompass biosensors, which I think we've, we've covered, but it'd be great just to tackle that one head on as well. Yes, I didn't <laughs> go so much into the details on each <laughs> module, um, but this is an excellent uh, question just to cover. Yes, indeed, biosensors are a very important part of our course. And there is in, indeed throughout every module, there is the aspect of biosensors. So we look into the design, so different elements that you need to combine. We look at the different applications. So we have biosensors in healthcare, mainly for pathogen detection, but incidentally, we also have a biosensor design for soil health. So for bacteria that are determining how healthy is the soil. So this would be very fitting um, for, for this question. And we also look at the different nanomaterials and their advantages and disadvantages in terms of the biosensor design. Depending, do you want to design biosensor which is used externally? Do you want to use a biosensor which you need to inject into a human 
or uh, um, any kind of life test uh, subject? Or do you want to use some kind of biosensor that needs to be linked to the cloud or be related to a mobile device? All of these aspects will be covered in one way or another. Of course, we have only six weeks, so we can't go into the details. But our idea is to give an idea of a design of possible applications and equip the learners uh, with the knowledge where to find the solutions if they want to go a little bit deeper. So this would be an excellent fit, artificial intelligence and agrobiological production. Brilliant. Thank you, Liliana. That's that's really helpful. Um, and this could this could lead on quite nicely. Is that another question here? Um, does bio nanotechnology only rely on artificial elements? Good question. No, it does not. Actually, again, throughout the course, what we wanted to and what was my particular wish was to really show that nanotechnology is not about all of the artificial things that are made in the lab. And we have uh, uh, some examples of nanotechnology that is dating from thousands and years ago, where people have been using nanotechnology without knowing what they are using it for. So there, there will be. But another aspect that we cover is the bio-inspired nanotechnology. How do, does nature use some principles of nanotechnology to build stronger and more functional structures. We look at this. We look at structural color, for example, which is the color entirely made by nanostructured assembly of biological molecules. So we try to take lots of inspiration from nature uh, because we think nature is very clever, so we can learn quite a lot from it. So we will look into proteins, enzymes, and some other structuring elements. DNA, for example, we look, how can DNA be used for nanostructuring? So we cover all of these aspects. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question just come in. Um, have you developed your nanotechnologies based on nano-defined? Because regulations are a critical step to think about when we want to translate from bench to shelves. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Excellent question. Uh, we do, when we talk about viability, when we have a module, uh, a viability, we look, first of all, at the different regulatory space. So what are the different agencies that are concerned with regulations? And we look at the safety aspect and toxicity aspect as well. So how do you test for toxicity if you are talking about nanomedicine, where you really need to get your material into a human subject? And how do you regulate, regulate um, and define nanomaterials if you use them somewhere else? So this is very important. We also give you an access to some databases where you can get a little bit more information about different products that might contain nanostructures. So this is definitely an important aspect when we think about uh, um, translation from bench. And we try to encourage everybody early on in their uh, assessment phase, as the, you are preparing over six weeks to answer a big question, we encourage you very early on to think about toxicity or potential toxicity, about regulatory bodies that you might need to contact before you actually go into the production. And we also encourage you to think about the cost aspect as well of your material, because you might come up with an excellent solution that is absolutely non-viable. And this is uh, extremely important. So definitely we do take this aspect of uh, regulation and toxicology uh, into, um, you know, into account. Brilliant. Thank you, Liliana. Um, I think we might have some time just for, for one final question, which we've got here. Um, and I think we, we 
touched on it slightly. Oh, we've just had another one pop through as well. Let's mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> have a quick check. Um, let, let's start with that one and we'll, we'll pop back because I think we may have touched on the other one a little bit more uh, within the presentation. So um, I'm really interested in doctoral study in nanomedicine. How can green chemistry be used in nanobiotechnology? Green chemistry can be used anywhere, really. It all depends uh, what do you want to use it for. Um, and particularly in nanotechnology or nanobiotechnology, you can even use green chemistry to make nanomaterials. That means you don't need to use harsh chemicals to make nanomaterials. There are lots of strategies that are exploiting microorganisms or enzymes to do certain reactions. Particularly microorganisms are interesting as a potential factories for materials. So you can sometimes program microorganisms to make particular elements, which you can then combine. So I would say you can use green chemistry wherever you have intention of using it. And also in nanobiotechnology, mainly for designing some of the elements that you might need. Um, you can also, in, if you talk about bio nanotechnology, for example, that example of batteries, which uses viruses and nanoparticles uh, to help increase the storage capacity of the batteries is partially driven by green chemistry because you are using a virus as a part of your element. Uh, So you don't need to use any kind of artificial material, plastics or any kind of metal um, that you might have in the limited amounts. So I would say if you want to use green chemistry, you can definitely find a way to use it in this very diverse field. Brilliant. Thank you, Liliana. I think I think that's probably enough questions. I think we've done a pretty good job <laughs> in answering most of the things today. Um, so yeah, that, that brings us to, to the end of today's presentation. So it's just a quick thank you to all for, for joining us today. Uh, a big thank you to Liliana and the team. Um, if you do have any other questions, then please do reach out. Uh, we'll endeavor to get back to you on uh, any questions or topics that we haven't been able to address. But um, just as a reminder, there will be a short survey that we send out when you exit the webinar today, uh, which will give you the opportunity to ask those questions if you haven't already. Um, and then please do take a couple of moments to provide us with some feedback. Um, and also just a reminder as well, keep an eye out for that follow up email later this week in which we'll share the recording of today's webinar uh, and then some further useful links that have been mentioned today as well. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you and hope to see you in the course for some cool ideas.